<clears throat> okay, so um, the reason I talk about uh, this subject is because I discovered an interview with uh, David Bowie, um, who was not an architect, of course, and he, he, he said it very clearly that um, to be an artist is uh, almost by definition uh, related to, to being uh, dysfunctional, that uh, all artists in a way are more or less uh, dysfunctional. And I, I believe there is some truth here. And, and his truth relates to the truth of Charles Baudelaire, who said that uh, uh, an artist is like an albatross. Uh, the big bird, which can uh, can fly but cannot walk, and in that sense, the the artist is dysfunctional, because he or she cannot really walk. I mean, uh, is inadequate for what we call reality. Most artists, poets, writers, uh, uh, they 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 have a difficult time on earth. They love the world and they love uh, nature. And they love uh, maybe even human beings. They love uh, the, the human drama. They, they inspire themselves from it. But, but at the level of so-called normal life, they are really inadequate. Most, most of them are crippled. They, they, uh, they, they don't function easily. That's why we have the poets die the youngest. The architects live the longest. Well, maybe now, in a way, what I'm trying to talk about here is a, an architecture made by architects who are poets, and I'm, I'm not wishing that they, they, they die at, a, at an early age like the poets, but, but coming back to the albatross mentioned by Charles Baudelaire, indeed, the artist is the one who has no problem to open his or her wings and fly through imagination, through poetry, through dreaming. But if you ask the same artist to pay the rent or to pay some bills or to handle uh, bureaucratic matters, the artist collapses, is unable to function, is lost in the Kafkian's castle. So I think in many ways, many artists are very, very vulnerable, very fragile uh, at the level of so-called normal life. The architect, on the other hand, although it has there is a, an artistic side to the architect. The architect through the very nature of what he or she practices uh, is more able to negotiate with society, with life. And maybe that's one explanation why architects live long lives. And very rarely they die uh, in, uh, you know, embarrassing uh, uh, ways, you know. Louis Sullivan was one of the very rare examples of architects who later in life um, didn't uh, arrive actually at the, at, the, at the fruits of a labor of great significance. And he was one of the great architects. There are probably others less known. Anyway, uh, the word dysfunctional is used in, um, you know, in, um, social work in psychology as referring to you know problematic relationships uh, usually within within the family or uh, at the level of society of a social group but how would a dysfunctional architecture be i am asking myself so let me begin uh, the journey into this uh, field I searching for the image images with dysfunctional ar uh, architecture, I came across this image which I like. And although I might not explain it uh, very well for to myself first, but I, I kind of like it, you know, because in a way I, I recognize myself in, the, in one of these three human beings, meaning am I known by myself? Am I known to myself? Not really, you know, if I am to be honest. I mean, yes, I look in the mirror. Yes, uh, I think I, I know myself, but do I really? I think I am unknown to myself in many ways. So in a certain way, you know, uh, I, I am a problem both to myself and to others. Form follows fiction. This is what Bernard Chumi said. And, uh, you know, uh, we might not agree with him, but uh, in his provocative way, I think he's saying something that shouldn't leave us indifferent. 
you know, its majesty function uh, can be dethroned. You know, after all, what is function? You know, what is it? You know, that is so untouchable, so uh, you know, sacred that we cannot question it. it uh, you know, and I have seen in old cities, in old houses, a neglect for what we call function, and yet there are beautiful old cities and beautiful old buildings where we, which uh, which are very pleasant to live in. And yet they were not born from uh, the strict scripture that tells our form follows fi uh, function. So, you know, I am trying to illustrate this, that this function could be actually productive, could be actually beneficial. And uh, to stay away from this function could actually mean to stay away from the uh, uh, possible, uh, possible uh, positive effects of what so-called dysfunction uh, could, uh, could bring to us. This is what Friedrich Kiesler said, and uh, uh, it might be that tomorrow is actually his birthday and I will present his work in detail, but this is what he said. I oppose to the mysticism of hygiene, which is the superstition of functional architecture, the realities of a magical architecture rooted in the totality of the human being and not in the blessed or accursed parts of this being. So uh, again, he is attacking uh, the, the superstition of functional architecture and he advocates the benefits of, uh, of, of the magical architecture. What is that magical architecture? Well, maybe that magical architecture could relate to magical human beings who allow themselves to show themselves to the world and to themselves as they really are, with dreams, with weaknesses, with capriciousness, with troubles, with everything that constitutes the human being, which we try so carefully to hide away from in our, uh, you know, simplistic and dogmatic and frigid white rectangular buildings. Uh, I'll show you now, I discovered, because I searched on, on Google Images for uh, dysfunctional architectures, and I came across the, the works of this man I never knew uh, before anything, Emilio Lopez Galeacho, um, where he says, I like to think of dysfunctional landmarks and Hotel Troya, these were two works he, he did, as high resolution architectural Machinima. I don't know what machinima is. Anyway, these are works that talk about the promiscuity of genre and typologies, the closeness between the monumental and the monstrous, the anomalous, anomalous attraction, scale as an aberration, representation as a, as a trap, and function as a nightmare. Yes, I would say it myself again, function as a nightmare. His gaze is not guilty, but distant and objective, strictly, strictly empirical. These images are not intended to denounce anything. They are cold, dispassionate, almost scientific records. No perspectives, no only elevations of that which lives hidden and concealed in the mind of the architect. Goya put it well, the sleep of reason produces monsters. But uh, the Elsvenia de Raison Produce Monstruos, uh, the, the title of a famous engraving by Goya, could also be translated differently with a different nuance. Instead of the sleep of reason produces monsters, and I found it actually translated in this way, the dream of reason produces monsters. But sleep does not generate only dreams, it also generates nightmares, which are negative dreams, if, I, if we are to call them so. But let's contemplate again these words, what lies hidden and concealed in the mind of the architect. It is true. There are many things that are hidden within our uh, soul, so to speak, in our mind. And the psychoanalyst tries to bring to the surface what is hidden. 
But the architect is very good at avoiding what is uncomfortable in uh, maybe in his own soul, in his own mind, and then uh, to a larger extent uh, in the minds and the souls of those he serves. I think it's very, very important to try to dig deep and to, uh, at, at, to yes, to attempt to, to access what is hidden and also to ask ourselves, why are we hiding something? So Emilio Lopez Gariacho is an architect, visual artist and composer. What an interesting triad. In 1992, he co-founded Arquimedia, a group focused on the relationship between new media, architecture and communication. He is deputy publisher and art director of Frontera D Digital Magazine. I'll just show some images that this man uh, produced. And they are uh, puzzling. Uh, of course, you know, if you are to build a building, you might not uh, indulge in building it in this way. But I found his images uh, enticing, you know. Actually, if something like this was built, I would probably be very curious to uh, arrive around it and to, to explore it, to, to see it. You know, look at this, you know, we, of course we recognize parts of this uh, architectural collage, certain parts, but not everything. And actually the most uh, uh, provocative are those that we do not uh, identify easily. What are these things? What are these machineries, you know? Is this a collage of, uh, you know, building structures or uh, fragments of structures or fragments of architectures fly? Uh, are they rooted on, uh, on earth? Uh, but all in all, there is something that is provocative because he, I think indeed he was trying <clears throat> to, <clears throat> to reveal the unknown, the hidden here as well. <clears throat> Architects, of course, this could be called very conveniently, uh, fant fant fantasias, you know, fan fantasies. And in a way they are, of course, but I think it's important to access what we call the fantastic within ourselves. I think Fyodor Dostoevsky, the great Russian writer, was correct when he said that um, true reality is not what we call reality or the real. That's not real. What is true reality is some kind of a mixture between the, what we call reality and the fantastic. The fantastic does exist, is within ourselves. It reveals itself partially during the sleep at night. Sometimes in our reveries or in, in our contemplative mo moments, we also have access to that side of ourselves which usually uh, we stay away from. So that's why I think this works like this without uh, describing them of, as being, uh, you know, totally feasible or buildable. Buildable. They are. They are expressions of what happens when the irrational erupts, and uh, the, when the irrational is allowed to 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 manifest itself, at least to an extent. So. In this sense, I think uh, his images are, you know, uh, interesting because it's almost some kind of a, um, uh, how to say, assemblage between uh, what we expect, between uh, the, the already seen, the predictable, and then there is the unexpected, the, the, the provocative side, which emerges, erupts, from within ourselves. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think that if we explore the depths, the jungle sometimes, the night, the darkness, the complexities of our dreams, our architecture would be different. But we don't do that, you know? We are so uh, happy to find refuge within the rectangular paradigm and uh, within uh, the Neufert, uh, uh, you know, uh, dogmas that we forget that we are actually much richer than, than what reason imagines we are. 
Anyway, I'm not saying that these works are, uh, you know, uh, necessarily, uh, you know, masterpieces to be followed. They are explorations of a side of reality which we usually ignore. In a way, they are psycho architectures. This functional by Carpenter's workshop gallery uh, in Venezia, in Venice, uh, this was in 2019, uh, was an exhibition with this name, Dysfunctional, so two years ago in Venice. Uh, and uh, this is um, uh, easier to, you know, to comprehend because actually you have here a number of objects we, which usually uh, we, we, we don't conceive of in this way. You know, like, uh, look at this chair, you know, it's, uh, it's obviously, uh, uh, you know, uh, a vulnerable chair. Uh, uh, in, in an explicit way, it is uh, a little bit dangerous. But, but, isn't this chair in a way a possible self-portrait of almost any human being? Aren't we all to an extent wounded? I think we are. And we forget this. We think that we are invincible. We think that we are even the pandemic didn't uh, manage to um, uh, make us uh, self-reflective enough to understand that we are in a way like this chair. You know, we give the impression that we can still function, but, but uh, with some difficulties. Anyway, this was an exhibition in 2019 in Venice. Look even at this uh, clock, you know, uh, is it measuring time? Uh, I mean, is it, is, it, is it working properly? Well, not really, you know, it's, so even, uh, you know, our obsession with watches, we have an unbelievable amount of watches in the world, you know, I mean, uh, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of kinds of watches. Every person probably has a few uh, instruments or gadgets that measure time. We have it on the laptop, we have it on the wall, we have it at our wrist. We measure time with unbelievable exactitude. But the truth is time in its essence is still escaping us. So maybe this uh, installation in Venice is kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, a commentary on that, that uh, we shouldn't be so sure that our measurement of time is uh, truly and impeccably so-called functional. Uh, what is this? Art, art? art does what it's good at, that is problematizes our expectations and all kinds of imperfection or uh, imperfections or dysfunctions are um, uh, illustrated through its, uh, uh, you know, unending uh, series of uh, um, imaginings or uh, provocations. Anyway, but when, you, when we talk about uh, dysfunction, we talk about disequilibrium about a lack of balance. So how is an unstable architecture? Usually we think that architecture is supposed to be stable, but there are architects, Peter Eisenman is just one of them, uh, that, that, that seem to actually desire instability, not stability. And, uh, you know, I think this is a subject for reflection that is needed, architecture and instability. Uh, instability is uh, scary indeed, yes, because it takes away, you know, the, the illusion that everything is under control, that we are safe. So an unsafe architecture, an unstable architecture is making us uh, uneasy. The Lacanian Villa that was designed uh, in a school of architecture in Texas under the guidance of a, a Spanish architect Gonzalo Vallo, who, who lives and works in, uh, in Vienna. Now look at this. Is this a functional house? First of all, we wouldn't even call it a house. Uh, why is the name of Lacan invoked? Because he was an important psychoanalyst. What does psychoanalysis have to do with architecture? Well, it's like asking what does my inner life 
have to do with architecture? Of course it does. It's just that somehow conventionally, architecture uh, keeps avoiding the darker truth about ourselves. Yes, there is now a concern with the cave. Uh, many architects uh, in one way or another uh, invoke uh, or evoke the cave. But here is a, a tormented and tormenting cave, you know, and what is it, you know, what the hell is this? Could we call it a house? Well, uh, with difficulties. Did we see such a house before? Not really. But isn't this house, it could be, let's say, it could be a house. It's represented as a house and it was uh, designed by an architecture student in uh, not too long ago. Is this house telling the truth about uh, life, about ourselves? Well, you know, it's subjective, of course, but maybe it says something about the, the, the torments, our inner torments, which they do exist. And if we neglect the inner torments, in my opinion, you neglect something that, uh, for example, uh, uh, the creator of the Swiss pavilion at the Venice Biennial in 2006, 16, uh, tried to evoke. Uh, and I'm going to show two Swiss pavilions. Interesting that these two Swiss pavilions, and they both received the Golden Lion at the Venice Biennial, were produced by a country you wouldn't associate normally with uh, instability and being unsafe and so on. This is Switzerland. Uh, this work by Christian Keres uh, is a very interesting work. I have seen it. I was there. I entered it. And this, you'll see that it's not a big difference between what he, he, he built, actually, and the previous project that you saw, uh, the Lacanian Villa designed by that student in uh, uh, the School of Architecture in Texas. Why would Switzerland uh, propose such a pavilion within uh, the Venice Biennial. I think in the same quest, and here maybe it's not, uh, not uh, totally unnecessary to mention that one of the greatest psychoanalysts in the world was Swiss, that is Carl Jung. Uh, you know, again, you, the functionalist would say, well, how can I bring the, the, the piano in? Or how could I walk straight uh, to I don't know what room without uh, hitting myself or without some difficulties? But why should difficulties be totally banished? Why? You know, and what do we gain from the obsession with comfort? You know, what? It's only an illusion because you can get crazy in the most functional apartment or house or building in the world. So it's not. You know, I mean, you could call this a monster. It's an architectural monster. Yes, it's white or whitish, but look at the shape and the form. They are monstrous. They are irrational. They are eruptions. They are not logical Apollonian uh, constructs. No, they are, they are uh, you know, unbearable, you know, and the inside is, uh, look at it, you know, no one could live like this. But isn't our mind somehow similar to what we look at here? I mean, is, is our mind a cube or a square? I doubt it. Uh, so, you know, yes, in order to walk through this space is difficult. But why do you think these people entered? Why do they stare? Why do they walk through it? Because it is enticing. And maybe there is an un, untold truth about this space which the Cartesian simplistic, diagrammatic, frigid and sterile structures that we build say nothing about. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think the Swiss seem to know something that perhaps all of us should know, should attempt to know. What made these people leave their shoes outside of the, of the, of the, of the, um, cavern of the cavernous inside and, and, and step in. Curiosity, uh, curiosity, the desire to experience something which in so-called normal life, they don't experience. The attraction of the dysfunctional, 
And actually the dysfunctional is associated almost by definition with pleasure. Well, with pleasure and its twin pain, uh, because uh, as uh, Leonardo da Vinci thought and said, pain and pleasure are twins and, the, and indeed they are. But when you eliminate one, and this is what functionalism does, it attempts to eliminate pain and in the process of eliminating pain, it also eliminates pleasure. Because what kind of pleasure can you have when you always work on the same corridor, one meter and 20 centimeters wide, with a ceiling of two meters and 40 centimeters above you, with mostly whitish walls, with uh, doors on the left and on the right? What kind of pleasure? It's an already seen. It's a deja vu. It's, it's something a deadly boring. So yes, we eliminated the pain, but in the process, we also eliminated its twin, that is pleasure. Here, you might have pain, but you also have the pleasure of an adventure. Such an interior means, if you assume it, uh, is generating uh, curiosity and pleasure. Besides, again, symmetrically looking at it, uh, uh, prob probably an unavoidable amount of um, pain. Anyway, so this was the Swiss pavilion in 2016. And now uh, look, look there, you know, these rational human beings, you know, descendants of Homo sapiens, leave their shoes outside and enter into this uh, so-called unreal, uh, you know, environment that, that, uh, offers them an experience which they don't normally have uh, in the midst of their so-called normal lives. Anyway, we are going to see a second pavilion done also by the Swiss in a very different from this one, but somehow with the same message, the uh, potential, the potentiality of dysfunction. So maybe looking back, the Lacanian villa was not such an aberration as maybe at first we might have been tempted to consider it. 2018, another pavilion also by Swiss, very different, but somehow the message is, is not very dissimilar. So curated by a team of Swiss architects, including Alessandro Bouchard, Lille, Tavor, Tavor, Matthew van der Plug and Annie, Wilhervara, the, the installation is called Svizzera 240, house tour and draws inspiration from interior photographs of unfinished apartments. Visitors circulate through a series of spaces that at first offer constructed views that make each new encounter look like, look like a typical photograph of a brand new living space. But as the visitor enters each new room, piercing the momentary illusion of the stage perspective and suddenly participating in the space rather than experiencing it merely as a visual composition, it quickly becomes apparent that the rooms and fittings are rendered at unexpected scale. The doors, windows, and power outlets might be much larger or significantly smaller than expected given the lack of visual context. Now here they are, at first I thought that these are the, uh, the curators, but I don't think they are because I have an image here actually later uh, with, uh, with the winners of the Golden Lion, also for, for Swiss architects. I don't know who these people are anyway, but look at the height of the, the kitchen counter. Now, this is certainly dysfunctional, you know, it's, uh, in fact, it's more than dysfunctional, it's not functional, you know, I mean, it's almost the height of a human being, you know, uh, you would say, come on, you know, this doesn't work properly, but magical things happen when you modify uh, or, or you alter the expected. Look at this door, which is, uh, which has a height smaller than the height of the human being who tries to go through it. You know, what does it mean to work through a door which is, let's say, one meter and a half 
tall or one meter and uh, 60 centimeter or so. Uh, towards the outside, there was nothing. It was, you know, uh, almost a, a banal, uh, you know, uh, architectural context. But there are still some, uh, like, for example, you have two doors, a huge one, a giant one, and a small one. And you wonder, you know, why are there two doors of different sizes? Here we see, um, uh, yeah, I mean, look, look at this, a giant window and then a very small door towards which this person who is much taller goes towards, you know. So this, this change in the uh, expected dimensions of what we build could provoke reactions, could provoke, uh, uh, could alert you. And, and being alerted is not a bad thing for consciousness. And uh, look here, the handle of the door is at two meters or so, not at 90 centimeters. But isn't it interesting? I mean, all of a sudden, uh, the, 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 this change in the dimensions, in the dimensioning of, uh, of uh, various things is, is, is uh, problematizing uh, uh what or who we are i mean this person is an adult and she seems to be uh, you know uh, very small you know even smaller than a child you would say because of the because of that handle and the dimensions of the door um so here we see you know we see uh, again a play with different dimensions which could be disorienting but uh, something happens i think which is beneficial potentially in, in being unsettled, in being, uh, uh, look, look at these giant doors and look at this one. The handle is at a higher level than, than uh, you know, the top of this, uh, of this door. So, you know, it's, it's in a way like in a dream. It's not, it seems to be no real, not real. But, but, but I think the, the unexpectedness is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, uh, increasing uh, our our uh, involvement with what is around us, it alerts us. And uh, uh, as I said, the discomfort could provoke that curious and paradoxical pleasure, which is somehow connected with, uh, again, in a in a paradoxical way, with pain. Uh, again, uh, we have seen this one. Uh, look at this, isn't it? <laughs> Isn't it uh, surreal somehow you see this child who is, uh, you know, uh, I mean, you would say this door is for children, but uh, it's, it's for everyone, you know, and you can, if you modify the, the restrictions or the recommendations of Ernest Neufer, you know, you, 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 you create uh, dynamics without necessarily creating uh, very dynamic forms. You just modify, uh, you know, uh, you, you, you alter the, uh, the expected, the predictable, uh, like here, you know, it, it, it's, 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 it's a discomfort, it's a dysfunction, but this dysfunction, I think, could have very beneficial uh, effects. Look at the lady on the right. She, becomes, she became a child again. You can see on her face that, that uh, uh, you know, is this... Uh, this uh, astonishment, this, uh, this wondering. And uh, I wonder how many so-called functional apartments or buildings or houses could provoke such an expression on the face of anyone? Almost none. But I think if we can, if we, if we can build in such a way to, to provoke this kind of reaction as the facial expression of this person uh, uh, shows us, we are making something that, uh, that is perhaps more worthy of being made. Because these people here, you, you can tell they're all enjoying themselves, you know? Look at this one, you know, eager to photograph. The other two also, they become children or children-like, discovering the world anew. So this function could be actually very, actually functional in the sense that it stirs up emotions, hidden parts of ourselves, that, that perhaps need to be activated. These are the four curators of the second golden lion that the Swiss uh, got. 
bravo to them two years um, you know in a row so to speak they got the golden lion in venice and that is because they challenged our assumptions they challenged the predictable they brought in the unpredictable Okay, against functionalism. I wrote sometimes, some, uh, some a while ago, not too long ago, uh, two, three years ago, this text. I hope I can read it. Uh, it's, it's not funny. Uh, it's called Against Functionalism. It is not funny. It is not exciting. It is plain boring. Life should not be comfortable, but challenging. Functional, functionalism is not challenging. There is no struggle involved. Things are so-called perfect. So we navigate through functionally spaces like a duck in the water, no water stains. Who needs that? We need to, the struggle. We need the discomfort of the pioneers who entering a virgin forest did not and do not find conventionally built asphalted walkways. Give us back discomfort. Fuck functionalism. It is highly dysfunctional, this gray, mediocre functionalism because for our soul and our thirst for a much needed sense of adventure, it is boring like hell. We don't need it. We, don't, we need danger and discomfort. We need to feel alive like a rejected lover in quest for the affection of the loved one. Process is everything, the way to give us back discomfort and bury Neufer. Give us dejection and struggle, painful struggle, the more, the better. Give us dysfunctionalism. We would love it uh, with the same uh, uh, ardor the dejected lover loves the object or subject of his or her desire. Give us back desire. Give us a feeling that we are still needed on this earth, that not everything was solved. Fuck functionalism. Function, functionalism. Sorry for the non-academic non, non um, uh, wording. So Eduardo Macintosh, capitalist symbiosis. Well, I don't know exactly what he meant, but I like the images. Uh, I like the images. I don't know why he called them uh, as he did. I see this concord here. I see, I see uh, the, you know, these functions somehow you know, uh, in a way relating to the first works that I showed, this collage of uh, various um, architectural uh, entities, you know, possibly architectural entities. Uh, and I think if we free our imagination from uh, dogma and inhibition, we can create an architecture that is truer to life uh, than, than the, uh, the, the simplistic variations that uh, we arrive at in, 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 in uh, you know, following the prescriptions of the um, priests of uh, rationalism. Günther Dominik, I showed his work before, I show you again this Z Bank, bank in, in Vienna. Uh, towards the outside is a mosque, but uh, inside, unfortunately, when I visited it, there was a, a luggage store inside, but you'll understand that the space this architect created had nothing to do with, uh, with this function of displaying luggage, luggages. You see the luggage is here, but above is something else. And uh, there is a, uh, you know, this uh, obvious tension and conflict between the vision of the architect and the banality of the function the building arrived at serving being rented in that in this sense the space but initially it was a bank a bank if you can imagine and then the bank i don't know uh, ran out of business or moved somewhere somewhere else and the space was rented for a, a seller of luggage but you know uh, the banality of uh, displaying in a you know a predictable way the luggage uh, does not take away from the drama of uh, these um, uh, psycho pipes that he is um, I mean they are physical all right but uh, you know in a way it's almost like a trip into 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 our own uh, uh, psychological uh, um, you know, reality you know, into our soul, into our mind is, is, is contorted. It's because, yes, I don't think that our inner life was drawn by God 
uh, or whoever drew it uh, with the T-square and the rectangle. Now, sorry for, uh, about the luggage. I, I prefer to concentrate on the architecture and this architect did a good job, a very good job with this building. And uh, he did it before deconstruction actually. And this is not quite deconstruction. It's a little bit different because it has a level of organicity. Uh, but I, I, I still think it refers to this function. And maybe it's a dysfunction that existed within the architect himself. An unhappy man, maybe, uh, you know, a man uh, troubled by his own demons, an albatross, in other words, a poet. Anyway, uh, an unusual, a very unusual bank. And I chose it as another example. There are others, of course, of what I might call dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional architecture. Well, you know, this picture amuses me because these people look at the pieces of luggage that they want to purchase. They all look down. They don't look up because what is up, they prefer to ignore. And in a way, this is what architects do. We look uh, down, so to speak, to the necessities of, you know, functional necessities of our buildings. And we forget to look up at the clouds that move so freely and so beautifully above our head. Now, I'm not saying here that is a uh, parallel, I mean, that is the same thing with, um, with the movement of the beautiful uh, uh, clouds, but it shows uh, another reality, a dysfunctional one, if you want. Uh, look, even the concrete parts, you know, which are mysteriously Gothic sometimes, although this building, somehow, although this building is uh, a modern building. I mean, it was built around 50 years ago, uh, but, but this reference to a different kind of architecture, you know, maybe a little bit like uh, Rudolf Steiner, or uh, you know a certain brutalist architecture, but it's organic, it's mysterious. You wonder what is it doing here? Well, what is doing here is uh, unsettling us. That's what it is doing here, and it's good. We should say thank you, uh, Mr. Dominic, for unsettling us. In as much as the entrance into the now store from a bank uh, is unsettling us. Look at. Uh, uh, the canopy, which with its uh, visceralities. Anyway, <laughs> the amusing uh, world of, uh, of uh, you know, backpacks uh, for school, now that the school opened, now the pictures were taken a few years ago, and uh, the world of architecture, uh, very, very different. Anyway, moving forward, and even the, the pavement in front of the, of the, of the building is, um, problematizing uh, the trajectory of our of our uh, you know uh, walking because it's 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 not straight it's, uh, it's yes it is uh, it is uh, confusing a little bit uh, now um, there is i discovered uh, an interesting website uh, belongs to socks and there i found these functional plans uh, and uh, I don't show here a lot, maybe, uh, you know, a few pictures, but I, 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 I suggest to you, if you are interested to, to take a picture of this or a, um, a, a screen, uh, you know, to, 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 uh, to, to remember this uh, website, because uh, I think it's a very interesting website and it shows alternative ways of uh, doing architecture. So these functional plans, the floor plan, is a reflection of the societal conditions and the historical context in which it is created, thus embodying specific notions of privacy, familiar bonds, or social relationship among inhabitants. Whenever the plan doesn't interpret the notion of inhabiting within the parameters of what is considered normality, in a specific moment in history, we call it dysfunctional. A dysfunctional plan implies a questioning and a critical resistance towards any notion of standardization. Through configurations of non-canonical spaces, it problematizes any comfortable accommodation for the daily living functions and may even become a means of conflict, misbehavior, and abuse. On the other hand, it may represent an attempt to embody hypotheses of subversion against a given model. And it is true. 
uh, we, we might even one day uh, meet in order to talk about subversive architecture. The architecture of madness. These are heliographias by this uh, person, Leon Ferrari. Uh, the architecture of madness, you will see some. So uh, Leon Ferrari, sorry, an L is missing, was an Argentinian conceptual artist who worked with a series of extremely different medias through the years, trained as an engineer, he gained notoriety in the 60s, thanks to his polemical works on religion and politics. Exiled in, exiled in 1976 in Brazil, he started a series of plans using heliography, the technical, the technique traditionally employed by architects until the advent of the computers in order to reproduce their drawings. Combining letter set icons to hand sketches, he invented labyrinthic worlds, which became part of a series called the architecture of madness. And you'll see now some pictures. Uh, it is madness indeed, but probably from space, uh, the human uh, activities do not look very different from what we see here. These are, uh, yes, maddened labyrinths with a, um, uh, you know, a void in the center. Cars, cars, and again cars, but cars unregulated by uh, restrictions or laws or rules. Anyway, from a, a far point of view, the large images look as chaotic patterns of walls, people, furniture, and cars. At a closer look, it is possible to realize that the symbols stage paradoxical situations in which people line up to enter empty spaces or are confined in a series of small cubicles. The paradoxes can be read as metaphors of contemporary cities where alienated individuals wander without any apparent logic through irrational urban patterns. The works turn the technical drawings into a narrative, a symbolic device filled with sarcasm. So you'll see some, um, some works by this man, uh, um, you know, uh, commentary on uh, collective life, but uh, a collective life, which is a sum of individual madnesses, perhaps. Anyway, I move a little bit quicker because we still have some, uh, some more material to, um, uh, to present. Here is the, the madness of, uh, you know, repetition, you know, uh, 1000 doors or whatever. Anyway, not all pictures are very easy to read, but uh, I saw that somehow they do have to do with what we call the dysfunctional. And yes, the dysfunctional can be uh, uh, discovered uh, in many places and in many forms. Um, Kopf Himmelblau, Vienna apartment building. Uh, this is a building I saw uh, with some students and also by myself. This is a building which has some so-called dysfunctional parts. And interestingly, I would say exactly the dysfunctional parts make the building stand out and be interesting and be engaging. You know, uh, without the dysfunctional part, the building would be uh, maybe okay, but maybe not enough being just okay. It is the dysfunctional part that uh, attracts attention. And yes, uh, it was not built without uh, resources. It was built with some efforts, perhaps financial, maybe in the first place. But I think it is worth it because it's some kind of a mask that testifies strangely about something that is behind the, the elevations of the conventional building. And uh, it's almost like a yeah, a, a betraying mask, a mask which tells a truth about the building, which without a mask would not have whispered it. I don't know if I explained correctly what, what I felt or thought. Anyway, uh, it is a dysfunctional addition to an otherwise maybe functional building. In the back, uh, well, there were three buildings built by the same uh, uh, architects, uh, uh, there is an incredible, uh, uh, you know, cantilever part and actually a gathering room, some kind of uh, amphitheater, or I don't know what it is. You can, uh, you can uh, house or uh, protect or, uh, 
cover a group of a large group of people underneath it look here it's emerging from the otherwise regular architecture behind it and it is cantilevered and it's also red i mean you can't miss it um, at first I, I saw it accidentally being on the bicycle in vienna and it attracted my attention i didn't know it was designed and built by Kok Himmelblau, but it did so the color also is a disjunction is disjunctive to the green of the trees so you have two kinds of provocations. First, the, 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 the significant, almost outrageous cantilever of this uh, large room. And second, the, 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 you know, the, the, provo the chromatic provocation. Now the Cleveland Clinic Lou Rubo Center uh, by Frank Gehry, it's also a provocation, a dysfunctional provocation, which also relates uh to the to to, uh, to 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 the brain damage it is uh, it is a clinic uh used for uh, for treatment of uh, you know uh, uh brain uh, disorders and uh, and brain brain illnesses and the building expresses the the you know the the tragedy, the pain, the suffering, the distortions, the yes, the problems with the with the brain, which was affected uh, uh, dramatically. This is the building. You probably know it. Uh, it has been published. Uh, of course, it is. Of course, it is a building that, uh, if you want to get well, you might not be tempted to enter in because. You know, the building is telling you that um, things are not all right on this earth and uh, your brain might uh, might actually, uh, through its illness, might actually uh, convey what the world at large conveys. It's, you know, the works of Frank Gehry, uh, but this one in particular also relating, you know, to the function, uh, the functions that were to, to be served through this building is uh, is amplifying somehow uh, a certain amount of angst uh, the cars are running of course but the building is telling you you run you run but you cannot run from your inner truth and from your inner troubles and perhaps even from your brain uh, uh, damage um, so frank gary uh, brain clinic if i am to call it so and uh, <laughs> Yeah, I laugh, but uh, you know the building is uh, almost ominous uh, through its, uh, uh, you know, uh, maybe truthful uh, uh, negative exuberance, if I am to call it so. Anyway, uh, dysfunctionalism, architectural dysfunctionalism, with the honesty to show itself as such and not with a dishonesty to lie about itself. Okay, and now we arrive at another building by Frank Gehry, which in my opinion is not bad, although some people criticize it, but I know that Frank Gehry inspired himself from the paintings of Van Gogh, Vincent Van Gogh, who was a very troubled uh, young man actually, who lived there and who painted there furiously. And the fact that Frank Gehry wanted to find inspiration in, uh, at least in some paintings by Van Gogh, uh, shows to me that uh, Frank Gehry is actually an informed architect. He's not, he's not just playing with forms. In this case, he found uh, some kind of a metaphysical uh, inspiration or artistic inspiration for his architecture. You know the tower. And the tower, after I read, I didn't know at first what inspired him, but he studied the paintings of uh, Vincent van Gogh and tried to find some kind of an equivalent of his torment, torments in life and in art through architecture. A difficult uh, attempt, uh, no doubt. And uh, unfortunately, most of the time uh, on the media, they. Uh, see a relationship between this building and uh, 
a specific painting by uh, Van Gogh, but actually it was a different painting by Van Gogh that inspired this, uh, uh, this, this building. The base though is different, but the base makes a reference to a Roman amphitheater that is not too far away in Arles from where this tower was built. What interests me for this presentation is particularly this tower, the top part, because it is there where Frank Gehry tried to connect with uh, Vincent van Gogh. And, uh, you know, you would say, this is madness. This is uh, dysfunctional, totally dysfunctional. This is a troubled building. Well, it was intended to be like this, to express the, 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 the troubles of a major painter. And uh, uh, you would say, what for? Well, I think architecture, if it's uh, true to its destiny and its essence, should not stay away from larger responsibilities. He could have built uh, just another you know, hotel or whatever you know, in a conventional way, but he wanted to relate to a narrative that was connected to that place. And in this case, he chose to, to connect with the most impro important artist probably who ever lived and created there. And you see here the painting of, uh, of Vincent van Gogh, but it, it was not actually this painting that influenced, but you can still see, even in this painting, I think, uh, I think Frank Gehry, uh, um, at least the attempt that he chose to, to, to honor uh, is something to appreciate, you know, to try to somehow through, through architecture to approximate, at least approximate, uh, something of the of the spirit of a, of a, of a, of a uh, worker of a painter a worker he was a worker in painting so to speak who who was tormented and you know if you think about his paintings how could you make a you know a placidly indifferent painting a, a building how how could you do that probably you couldn't anyway uh, so we see here these functions, you know, the, the dysfunctioning of the world. We don't have any longer the conventional world. Uh, now, I'm not saying that inside the building uh, we see the same uh, physical realities like we see them uh, at the outside, but still towards the outside, I think he tried to say something, you know, connecting with the painter uh, we all know, but uh, with those uh, troubles and the sufferings uh, and uh, soul contortions, we probably do not identify with, although we have our, uh, our own. I'm convinced of it. Anyway, aggregate urbanism, adventures in Archicad. You will see some sketches I did in Archicad for a competition in Copenhagen, uh, in, in Denmark which is without doubt a very, very dysfunctional urbanism, but which I thought could, uh, could be very provocative and uh, um, you know, stir up urban energies and, and, and create, a, yes, a, an urban dysfunction, but an urban dysfunction that could uh, uh, incite uh, new ways of life and new, new ways of interaction, human interaction. This is the first uh, sketch I did uh, I'll just show four plans. This is one. Uh, you see the existing buildings. Uh, yes, I was, I was trying to disrupt the existing order. Uh, another attempt. Another attempt. Uh, how, would a, how would a city or a town or a part of a city and a town be like and look like if it was like this or like this? you say, wait a minute, you didn't handle here the, you know, uh, functions. It's true, I didn't. But uh, there are suggestions for a different kind of urban, um, you know, uh, conglomerate, if I am to call it a conglomerate, that, that could be, yes, painful and, uh, and, uh, and very difficult, but uh, maybe, maybe uh, interesting and, and, uh, and uh, provocative, not just in a, in a negative way. And now, by the way of this, I'll show works by uh, an interesting architect and educator, Peter Trummer, or Trummer, Trummer, he's a uh, uh, German or Austrian. He teaches at the uh, Innsbruck, Innsbruck uh, uh, 
uh, School of Architecture uh, is very interesting. And uh, he showed this work at the Venice Biennial in 2012. And he calls this uh, aggregate, aggregate urbanism. And this is what he does. I mean, this is what he did then. Isn't it a dysfunctional, dysfunctional urbanism? Of course it is, very much so. But if this was built, if these were buildings, I would have loved to wander through these, uh, uh, you know, uh, buildings, if there were to be buildings. I would have been enticed and, uh, you know, I, it would have been inspiring, I think. But again, we should not forget what Leonardo da Vinci said, pain and pleasure are twins. So the pleasure would probably have been, uh, would have been uh, balanced by uh, an equal amount of uh, pain. The plan or the top view, aggregate urbanism. He identified five kinds of urbanism, and this is the fifth, the one he considered at that time in 2012, the one appropriate for our time. It is an instability. It is about instability. It is about dysfunction. And here are the five, uh, you know, ideograms describing the five uh, uh, during the human history, the five types of uh, uh, interesting that before the aggregate urbanism that he proposed is this, which is probably our urbanism, you know, a rationalistic, blunt and blank and, uh, you know, uh, you know, born from uh, the sterility of dogmas and uh, excessive uh, uh, trust in, in reason and so on. Is this one better than this one? I don't know. I will let you reflect on this. So here it is, uh, his insertion, his proposal uh, within uh, an urban fabric, a larger uh, urban fabric. You say it is disorder. Yes, it is disorder, but uh, disorder, as one uh, philosopher put it, is another kind of order, or it could be another kind of order. Uh, interesting that a mathematician in California invented the word, this chaos. So we have uh, order and disorder, it's opposite. But then we have chaos, but we, there is nothing to oppose chaos in the same way, symmetrical. So he invented, he, he thought of this chaos, but this chaos is not order, it's something else. So it would be very interesting actually to reflect to the possible meanings of the word this chaos and the difference between this chaos and order. This I think is not, I wouldn't call it actually chaos. I wouldn't call it order either, of course. Maybe it's this chaos, or maybe not. Anyway, Wolf Prix in Perugia, again, Kopp Himmelblau. I love this work by Kopp Himmelblau. You know, it's, <laughs> it's just a roof between these two buildings, but I think it's brilliant. You know, it's, it's dysfunctional. I mean, it's function, it does have a function, an ecological function, you know, uh, it's an uh, energetical uh, roof, so to speak, but but its contortions testify. I mean, the 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 this roof transcends uh, function as we know it, and it becomes. Look at look at the complexity of the work. He actually built it together with the students there in Perugia, and. You know, isn't reality like this? We think reality is simple, is simplistic, is diagrammatic, is rational. No, it's not. It's rather a composition, a complex composition. Of, of, it's a hybrid reality of many parts, uh, some contorted, some, some less contorted, but all in all, look at this. You know, uh, I, I think it is brilliant to make of something, you know, so complex and so both organic and mysterious, uh, um, uh, you know, in between two buildings, uh, I don't think it's easy. Uh, they did it. And I, 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 do, I do think this roof, uh, this roofing is, uh, is uh, uh, 
beneficially dysfunctional, although it does have a function. And this is the paradox I'm trying to somehow put forward that in a certain way, what we call dysfunctionalism could be actually more functional than functional, functionalism itself. In the, in the contortions of dysfunctionalism, new possibilities are born. And those new possibilities could serve life much better than what we call functionalism. Anyway, um, so uh, bravo to them, to the architects and the students who did this. It's surreal. It's not of this world. It's, but it was built on Earth between two existing buildings in an Italian town. You see, so-called normal life takes place here. And then in between these two buildings, we witness the otherness of good art and the otherness of good architecture. In essence, this relates with the clouds. And in essence, this relates to the albatross Charles Baudelaire talked about, symbolizing the artist who can fly but cannot walk. Okay, we move forward. We have a few more things to say to, to see urban heterotopia. I like this word heterotopia, which, which seems to come from uh, Foucault. You can find uh, information or uh, an entry about heterotopia on Wikipedia. Uh, and uh, I am going to show something that maybe it will not surprise you very much. It's a fragment of the house where I, I, I spent my childhood. Uh, childhood in, in, in Transylvania, which was in, 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 at least in some respects, dysfunctional. You know, first of all, there were no bathrooms at first. I had to bring uh, water, uh, you know, from downstairs where there, is a, there was a room where water was running. We didn't have bathrooms. We shared toilets. I remember when I used to go to the school, I was living here on the second floor and uh, you know, I did descended the stair, I crossed the bridge, and here then a neighbor came out with, uh, with a pot uh, with what her children produced during the night, because again, she didn't, they didn't have a bathroom, we said hello to each other, we saluted, we interacted, we wished each other good day, I descended, it was life, something that is missing in a conventional block of flats. And you see these interstitial spaces, yes, there were some, uh, there was some discomfort, uh, you know, most of the time of a so-called functional, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, functional, uh, a functional discomfort. For example, some apartments you enter through, through the kitchen, you know, the, the access into the apartment was through the kitchen. It was okay. Nobody died and people lived and lived long lives. So what I'm saying is uh, our obsession with a very narrow understanding of what uh, or interpretation, because it might be an interpretation. It might be that uh, Bernard Jumi was right. Function is a fiction. So uh, look at the entrance here in this. You know, it's very poor. And actually, the height of this very old gate, which is 500 years old, is about one meter and a half, like in the pavilion, the Swiss pavilion in Venice that we saw. It's okay. I mean, I hit it once because I was tall, uh, because I was experimenting, walking without my eyes open, just like um, Wolf Briggs and his partner uh, experimented with doing architecture with the eyes closed. And I hit myself on, you know, uh, with uh, my forehead at the top of this uh, gate. Anyway. The old machine in the old city. I took some pictures in my old hometown when some very old machineries, but very vigorous, very powerful, uh, invaded the city to do some, uh, to refurbish the, the, you know, the streets. And I, 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 I like the, the viscerality, the dysfunctionalism that, that, that uh, irritated the domesticity of the building. You see the little bit of the building here. But this machinery, which looks almost demonic or diabolical for my imagination, I found them very interesting. And again, in a strange way, I, I see these uh, machineries, these old machineries, uh, somehow relating to my own soul, my own imagination, the, the, my Jungian shadows, whatever is within myself. I, I find in these so-called imperfections and dysfunctions, 
some kind of a replica or a, a you know a, a, a parallel reality which actually reflected my own. I like this. I like these things, you know, uh, you could say I am uh, something wrong with me and it's possible. But I, I, I look, uh, here is the so-called normal life on the left. And this is the abnormality of the old machinery, which was working on the, on, on the road. Why is it that our architecture stays away from externalizing the drama of, uh, you know, of the life of the uh, its, uh, citizens, of the life of the inhabitants. Why is it that we don't don't show that that life and reality are much more complex than our uh, sterile uh, rectangular uh, white uh, white walls? Now, here is a project was submitted by someone maybe from Indonesia. I'm not sure. A project for a competition. I launched the House of Oxymorons. We still have a few more image, images and we end. This, he did a house, he proposed a house for a couple uh, whose members suffered from contradictory sleeping diseases. They both had problems with sleep, but different illnesses. Uh, let me see, yeah, one suffered of insomnia and the other one suffered of narcolepsy, which, which means I learned uh, then excessive daytime sleepiness and insomnia, you know, problems to fall asleep. So they both met at night because they both couldn't sleep at night. One because he slept too much during the day and the other one because he couldn't fall asleep. So he, an interesting idea, he brought, he, he imagined a house that would serve both and it like a dream house in a way. This would be the floor plan uh, I mean, not very new in a way. I mean, there are people who work kind of in, in you know, similar ways. Uh, so a house of the disturbed sleepers caught between dream and reality. And you see, it's exactly what I'm trying to evoke, that somehow dysfunction, as we call it, uh, provokes, uh, provokes the possibility, uh, uh, encourages, encourages somehow the meeting, the difficult meeting between what we call reality and what we call dream. It is exactly there in the midst of the conflict generated by these functions, the dream and reality interact and intersect. Just like in uh, this uh, conceptual uh, uh, project by, uh, uh, by this architect. Well, the cave motif uh, reappears, of course, because the old of the the, the, world, the world of the unconscious is related to the, um, uh, you know, to what we call dream. And, and, and so, you know, cave-like interiors are uh, auspicious for the meeting between what we call reality and what we call dream. The house appears as a solid shiny white box with some irregular shaped openings in its skin to show a little of its hidden inner world. And this is what this function does. This function betrays the hidden inner world. Something we stay away from because yes, it is painful often to witness the inner monsters. It is painful, but it's very possible that without doing that, we do not have uh, access to a superior sense of, uh, of pleasure and satisfaction and accomplishment. Anyway, now we see a project sent from New York City, the House of Conflict. I will not insist on it, but you, it, it, it was about bringing the opposites together in the same way the previous project thought of bringing together two uh, people suffering from uh, different uh, opposing almost uh, sleep disorders. Here, it's also about disorder. The disorder of the, an apartment, which is actually real, because we, we, when we design an apartment or a house or a building, we do not think about the realities of that life that they contain. We think about some kind of an idealized, simplistic, diagrammatic, schematic uh, understanding of what life is. But life is not like this. Look like here. Uh, we think the architect builds this apartment building, but these architects try to break the, the apparent order 
and the similarity of all the others here house and they created a different kind of uh, uh, a disjunctive reality a dysfunctional reality within the building which says nothing about these junctions about and about these functions and and yes i i think life if it is true to itself is not regular and is not uh, uh, you know deterministically and rationally uh, pinned down it, it is much more complex maybe it's not as tormented as, as a painting by vincent van gogh or that tower by uh, frank gary but we all have doubts we all have uh, uh, you know uh, inner dramas more or less um, intense now uh, this is another project i received from ukraine and you see in a way this is what we are taught to build and this is what we build uh, that is if we are lucky or unlucky to build but there is the other reality the the disturbing reality the red reality the inner fire and the inner fire can be can challenge the prism is the dysfunction of the fire it is the dysfunction of the 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 the, the challenge that that this red thing uh, places to the serenity, more or less serenity of, of, of the prism, is one that, in my opinion, is necessary. We need this function. And, 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 and this, this dysfunction is actually the dysfunction of a human being who thinks, who feels, who is not afraid to face the complex truth within himself. Now, towards a wounded architecture, you would say uh, something wrong with me that I am aspiring towards a wounded architecture. But I think wounds do exist. It's also known that in ancient societies uh, existed shamans who actually were wounded healers. It was only the, the wounded healer who was able to um, uh, cure other people. So how would a wounded architecture be like? I show some examples uh, before. I will show you some, uh, you know, uh, attempts to, to create a so-called wounded architecture myself through ArchiCAD because that's the only software I use besides uh, not using the one I uh, even received a diploma for, and that is ArchiCAD. Anyway, wounded architectures, uh, dis dysfunctional architectures very dysfunctional indeed uh, yes they are just uh, sketches of possible architectures pre-architectures but they assume conflict they have, they assume the, dis the the discomfort which makes possible an uh, uh, a, a different kind of human interaction one that does not say no to what is difficult to what is uh, unpleasant to what is uh, challenging and what is apparently uh, dysfunctional so uh, you know why should the building be only rational well because we are not only rational and if we are to tell the truth about ourselves we have to assume also different expressions of our truth and so several architects that i showed or artists try to do this if we succeed if we don't succeed but the important thing is to try to try to assume the, the, the difficult uh, challenge that dysfunction, or uh, you can use other terms to describe what is there, uh, uh, throw at us, because in a way that's what they do. They throw at us. Now, I will end the presentation with a, a reflection on, on where we are today. This is a book uh, published by a professor at MIT, uh, Sherry Turkle. She wrote a book, Alone Together. We all know that we cannot live without mobile phones these days, right? You see, everybody is with a mobile phone, everybody. And this you can see in every city of the world and maybe even in villages, uh, everywhere. Uh, what is this actually? Is it functionalism? I mean, is it serving life? In, in what way? Of course, we relate to each other through these gadgets, but aren't we addicted to them in the process? I think we are. You see, why we expect more from technology and less from each other? Well, uh, 
So who is dysfunctional here? Is the technology or is us or both? Uh, we could ask this question. And I will end by showing images of this photographer, Eric Pickerskill, who removes smartphones to show our extreme device addiction, which is in itself dysfunction. It's a dysfunction uh, 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 um, uh, which, which is uh, uh, um, uh, which, which is uh, presenting itself as an uh, unavoidable function. This is a paradox that uh, another paradox that, that the, the mobile phone or the smartphone seems to serve, uh, uh, you know, unavoidably the function of communication. But in the process of doing that, it alienates us from each other. So, you know, function turns out to be deficient towards life. This function, on the other hand, could, could turn out to be actually positive. So, you know, functionalism is very uh, uh, simplistic in its assumption that uh, uh, what rationally appears to be uh, beneficial to life is so, and it's not. And in this case, uh, the mobile phone, the smartphone, is actually doing a disservice in the name of doing us a service in our glorious age of communication. Now, of course, you could uh, say you are a hypocrite. You are using Zoom. You are, it is true. I am using technology like everybody else, and I'm happy I have this opportunity. Otherwise, it would have been more difficult. But when this man made his photographs, he made them before the pandemic. So under so-called normal conditions, we can very legitimately ask, are we not alone when we appear to be together by using these uh, gadgets for uh, communication? The use of technology for interaction in exchange for not interacting. And it's true. It's paradoxical again, because we, 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 we use the, the smartphones to communicate with the, with the 30,000 people all over the world while we're not even looking at the person near us. Look at these people at the table. So the photographer removed their, uh, their smartphones from their hands. But aren't they alone? I think they are very much alone. They are very much alone, although physically they are together, but they don't pay attention to each other. They only pay attention to the, to the, to the gadget. So where is the dysfunction here? Well, the dysfunction was born from the, the, the excessive, uh, the, the, the comfortable, the seductive uh, functionalism of the, of the smartphone, which tells you you can be together with anyone in the world. Yes, but with what price? By neglecting those in your own family at the same table. Look at this person almost risking to be hit by a car or so, looking on the iPhone and this is or on, on the iPhone or whatever, a smartphone. This is a very uh, seen uh, uh, scene. Uh, I mean, a, a very common, uh, uh, you know, sight these days. Look at these people: the mother and the and the daughter. You know, alienating from each other. So, where is the function, the beneficial function of the smartphone? When in fact, as a result, it's a it's a clear, clearly illustrated dysfunctionalism. Uh, anyway. Look at these people got married. They got married on the day you see here, just married. But they are two strangers to each other. They look at to this damn thing, you know, to this uh, gadget which promises paradise on earth, but which in fact alienates even two lovers who, who, who just got married. Isn't it bizarre? So again, you know, maybe we should reflect on what function means. And maybe indeed it is a function. Uh, uh, fiction, as uh, Bernard Chumi said, it's possible. Or here, again, you know, two people, but looking at their uh, uh, smartphones, you know, not at each other, not talking to each other. And what to, what to say about this? In fact, I regret that the photographer took away the, he should have left the, 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 the smartphones in their hands. They are back to back. They are not facing each other. They are not together. I mean, they are together like two bodies, but they are looking at something else. So again, 
it's about the dialectics between function and non-function or dysfunction. Or here, three children together and yet alone, very much alone, although they are together. So uh, where is the great benefit of, uh, of, of our glorious age of communication when in fact we are alienated from each other? And here, <laughs> are they in love? I don't know. Are they really? Anyway, uh, I'm not sure this uh, part of my presentation is, uh, is the, the most appropriate one to end my presentation with, but uh, this is what I did. And uh, I end now with, um, it's, it's a project sent from uh, Sweden for the same competition I launched, the House of Oxymorons. I'm not going to show you the project. I just want to read the second page, the, the, the one on the right uh, that, that, uh, that uh, was pre presented in the project. It's from a, from a book called American Psycho. And uh, it, it's about protesting the, uh, against the world of appearances, you know, where everything is just a surface. And uh, uh, you, can, you can actually uh, uh, see here, surface was all that anyone found meaning in. Surface, surface, surface. So in a way is the surface of functionalism because functionalism gives the impression that everything is right, that there is no depth, that things are clearly cut, clearly projected, clearly uh, built and clearly lived in. And things are not like this. And I will end this presentation with this uh, short uh, um, uh, excerpt from this book, American Psycho. Nothing was affirmative. The term generosity of spirit applied to nothing was a cliche, was some kind of a bad joke. Sex is mathematics. Individuality no longer an issue. What does intelligence signify? Define reason. Desire, meaningless. Intellect is not a cure. Justice is dead. Fear, recrimination, innocence, sympathy, guilt, waste, failure, grief were things, emotions that no one really felt anymore. Reflection is useless. The world is senseless. Evil is the own, its only uh, permanence. God is not alive. Love cannot be trusted. Surface surface, surface as was all that anyone found meaning in. This was civilization as I saw it, it's, uh, as I saw it colossal and jacked. Now, I live in this way, maybe not the most inspired way, but that was my presentation for today. And I thank you for being here. You are still here. I think I did something wrong. Uh, I I, uh, I don't know what I did. Uh